customers might be pricing your services to give you a good living and to allow you to work on the types of projects you would like to work on. The goals of this talk are to point out the difference between cost and value. This is very important for you to think about when you're working with free software. To help you price your goods and services better and to eliminate the myth that you cannot make money and a good living by working with free software. There's no magic here. In order to be able to make a living with free software, you have to be a good business person. You have to understand what your value is and the value to your customer. So let's talk about some of the ways that free and open source software can be very valuable to a customer as opposed to closed source proprietary software. I was working for Digital Equipment Corporation when there was a worm that was going out and attacking a lot of different Unix systems. My company, Digital Equipment Corporation, was able to create a patch for this worm, but it took us two weeks to generate the patch and to start to deliver it to our customers. In the meantime, our Unix systems, our customers' Unix systems, kept crashing. In the open source community, when they understood the issue around the problem, it took them three hours to generate the source code patch and put it up on the net. And therefore, all of the free software Linux systems were protected from this worm within three hours of the actual cause being known. So you have to ask yourself, who had the better service? The free software community or digital's customers? Now, Digital had a different operating system called Ultrix. It was an older operating system. Our customers were still using it, but our customers were not paying us any money to maintain it or anything. We almost did not generate the patch for them at all. They would have been helpless against this worm forever. I forced my management to do it, however, so the customers did get the patch but it was three months after the worm had it started attacking. Put yourself in the place of a business person who is expending a lot of money using their software and they need to have an extension to the operating system or to the application. In closed source software, they have to wait until the vendor sees the opportunity to make that extension and to be able to charge them for it. With free software, they can make the business choice of either staying with the software the way they have when they pull it down off the net, or paying somebody, like you, to make the change that they need to save money or make money. There are a lot of companies who employ people sole job to count licenses, to make sure that they are properly licensed with their various contracts and licensing of proprietary software. This, of course, is an expense to the company. But if they don't do that, if they are found guilty of using software that they have not paid for, they could then pay a heavy fine for pirating software. In the old days, we used to have to write all of the code for an application. But if you go out to SourceForge today, there's over 430,000 applications out there that are generated by 1.3 million developers. And while a lot of those applications are duplicates of each other, and some of those applications don't seem to have people working on them anymore, that's even if only a tenth of those applications were real, that's still 43,000 applications that you could choose from. You may not need all of the application, perhaps a portion of it is the part you need, but it's at least the part that was coded up one time and in use by somebody so that you can grab that code and use it in your own project. FOSS also tends to use open standards. We develop standards and then we develop the code that implements those standards. So you can improve the code underneath the standard or above the standard as ways of adding value to your customer. 
And finally, if your customer is interested in the path that the project is going, they can participate in the mailing list and participate in the creation of that, or at very least be able to follow along with where the developers think the project is going. This in comparison to a closed source company who right before they release the product announces the types of solutions that they're going to put into the next release. Now, of course, when we talk about free software in the English language, we have a problem. You're talking about free as in freedom or free as in gratis, or as we like to say, free as in beer. But when we're talking about freedom in software, we're talking about the chance to look at the source code, to be able to see how the program works, to be able to change the source code to meet our needs, to redistribute those changes to the people that need them, and the freedom to use the software for any purpose. In fact, the only freedom you don't have is the freedom to restrict another person's freedoms. You have to pass on the freedom that was given to you when you change the code. But none of these rules say that you cannot make money with free software. In fact, Richard Stallman encourages people to make money with free software because he knows that's the way the free software will continue. Now, FOSS could be a business like any other. If you are producing proprietary code, you have to know your market, you have to know the value added, you have to have a real business plan, which includes a marketing plan. How do people find out about your code? How do people realize that they want to buy it? And all of these things are true with free software. Again, there's no magic bullet here. Sometimes our free software marketing plan might simply be word of mouth. Other times it's the fact that people who are working on it are the actual customers themselves and they want to be able to use the code for their own use. But if you want to make a business out of it, you have to have a business plan like any other. Here are some of the jobs that are available if you use proprietary software. Let's pretend your, your name is not Bill Gates and you're not the head of Microsoft or Steve Ballmer, you're not the head of Microsoft. You want to make money with Microsoft code. Well, you can write programs that go on top of Microsoft's code. You can become a systems analyst to figure out how people could better use Microsoft's code. You can be an systems administrator of Microsoft's systems or customer systems using Microsoft. You can be a product manager working at Microsoft, developing ideas for new products. You can be a technical marketing manager explaining those technical pieces to customers so they can easily understand them. You could teach people how to use their products, either commercially or in a school or public school, private school. You could be a consultant helping people figure out how to make their business using those products. And you could be an integrator pulling all of those products together into a final solution. Every single one of these jobs can be done with free software. And actually, every single one of these jobs can be done better with free software. Why do I say that? It's because with proprietary software, you can't change the software. You can't make it integrate better. You can't know as much as the people that wrote that software if you want to teach somebody else. But with free software, you can change that software to meet the person's needs. And you can study that software to see how it works, and you can become just as expert in the working of that software as the person who wrote it. And if you are just as expert as the person who wrote it, you might be a better teacher than the person who wrote it because the person who wrote it may not be able to teach anybody. They may be one of those programmers, and you know they exist, who only stare down at their feet and never look a person in the eye. They're a great programmer, but they can't communicate. You're the best, you're the both. You're a good programmer and you can communicate, and therefore you may be able to make a great teacher. 
So all of these jobs can be done with free software. Now, a lot of people write free software for no money. They write it for a variety of reasons. Number one, they need it for their own use. We call this scratching their itch. And a good example of this are the people who work on the Blender program. Blender started off being a closed source proprietary program and the company went out of business. The people who used Blender liked it so much that they purchased the source code from the company and then developed a community to extend it forward. You, you give away your software because maybe you're the only person working on it, or you think you are, and you say, hey, I'd love it if somebody else could help me make this software better. So you're sharing the load. And maybe some of these people will meet you at a conference like this and say, Mad Dog, I really like your software so much. Let me take you out and buy you a beer. Well, let me buy you dinner. Well, let me give you a job. And these are all reasons why people wrote free software in the past, as well as liking to write free software. If you're a developer, you know that writing software is actually better than drugs. Drugs take time to work, and you usually have some type of flashback or something. But when you write that good piece of code and it works, nobody has to pat you on the back. You get that same thrill as having a good set of drugs, okay? Or somebody has a service model based on service, but not the code itself. And this is one reason why they might write the code and give it away. But there's a whole bunch of people who do write software expecting to get paid. And because, because their customers need to have the functionality in a shorter time than the community might give, customers will pay you to put that functionality in. And if the customer is smart, they'll also insist that you try and take that functionality and send it upstream to the people who created the software in the first place. Because they know if they get that functionality into the upstream product, they'll never have to pay for it again. But if they try and keep it to themselves, keep it proprietary, then when a new release of the software comes out, they'll have to pay to have it put in all over again. Another reason why people will pay to write free software is that there's really no reason not to have it be in the, in the main product. They say, I'm not a, I don't have any competitors or direct competitors on this. Why not put it into the main product and let everybody benefit from it? Maybe I'll even get some credit for having funded that particular extension. They want a feature that's unlikely to be written by anybody else. They have a business that's kind of off to the side and they need to have an extension written. Or they can easily leverage off of other software that's already been written and therefore with just a little bit of money they can get exactly what they want. Now I've been programming since 1969 and back in those days there was no such thing as a computer store. Computer stores really didn't start existing until 1977. Because before then, if you tried to buy a computer, you needed a tractor trailer truck to haul it away. And you needed three phase power to plow, plug it in. And you needed a 20 ton air conditioner to cool it. And you needed two and a half million dollars to buy your computer that had 64,000 bytes of core memory. Don't even ask about the disk drive. So there was no shrink wrap software. And when you went to write software for somebody, you made a contract with them. And you said, what types of inputs do you give me? What type of outputs would you like to see? And then you would start to write the code. And if you didn't do a good job, you didn't get paid. If the software was late, you didn't get paid. If the software was buggy, you didn't get paid. 
if you didn't have good documentation, you got it. <laughs> now just think about the time you went down to the computer store and you got that box of software off the shelf, you took it home and did absolutely nothing. When you took it back, what did they say? You opened the shrink wrap, sucker. <laughs> That's terrible. And when you paid for the software, it belonged to you. It didn't still belong to the person who wrote it. It belonged to you who paid for it. And if you wanted to put it on as many computers as you wanted to, you could. Of course, you could only afford one computer, but that's a different subject. <laughs> and you got the source code for it because there weren't enough computers of any one type to really justify generating a binary package. But in the 1980s, the hardware began to drop in price. And people said, we think we can manufacture software like we manufacture cookies. We make a little cookie cutter, and then we stamp it out and charge people a lot of money. But today, the hardware is incredibly cheap. We see things like the Raspberry Pi, a computer selling for $35. Imagine putting an office package on there that costs $400. Ah. So we think that the software should be tailored once again. Here's the real problem with mass production. In 1988, I actually purchased a software product that was binary only. It came on two 8-inch floppy disks. I paid a thousand US dollars for it. I started using it. It was great, but I found a bug in it. I called up the company. They had a hundred engineers. I got the president of the company on the line. I told him what the problem was. He said, oh yeah, I know what that is. He said that because he was a chief programmer. He says, I think we can fix that and stick it to quality assurance. And he could say that because he was a head of quality assurance. He says, if we do that, we can have it out to you tomorrow. And he could say that because he was the head shipping clerk. And sure enough, the next day, I got two more eight inch floppy disks in the mail and everything was fine. Now, if each one of his customers turned in two problem reports a year, that's 2,000 problem reports coming back to the 100 engineers or 20 problem reports per engineer. No problem. Everybody could work with that. But today the company has grown. They have 200 engineers. You can buy their software down at the corner store for $35. But they have 4.5 million customers. And now when you call them up, you no longer get the president on the line, nor the chief programmer, nor the head of quality, nor the shipping clerk. You don't even get the cafeteria worker. What you get is a voice that says, please press button number one for sales, button number two for support, and then you know what you get? Music, music, and then you get disconnected. It's not that these companies don't want to help you, they do. It's that they can't help you because they've got 4.5 million customers times two problem reports a year. That's 9 million problem reports coming back to the 200 engineers. That's 60,000 problem reports a day per engineer. Can't help you. Sorry. Software companies, though, love proprietary software because just for a relatively low investment, they can make billions of dollars. And their few jobs are non-local. You know, hey, a lot of money gets shipped from Germany, from the country of Germany to the country of Bellevue, Washington. And sure, there's companies here that make money by selling those products, but that's not the job that you guys want. You want to have a job of doing interesting work, maybe writing device drivers or going inside the kernel and doing things, writing compilers. And those jobs 
or in places like Silicon Valley or Redmond, Washington, or maybe in Berlin, you know, SAP is a very big company, but how many people do they employ? Now, Microsoft employs 70,000 people. We know that. 28,000 of those people are in sales and marketing and therefore have no useful purpose. So that leaves, you know, maybe 48,000 left. But out of that 48,000, some of those people are people who put software into boxes and take software out of boxes. Some people work in the cafeteria. Some people work painting lines in the driveway, you know. But when you come down to the people who bear the title of software engineer, it's probably about seven or 8,000 people. Compare that to the 3.4 million people who are writing software for SourceForge. And that number keeps growing all the time. Now, the real problem with the production software is it's not like printing money. It is like printing money, really, because you take this little plastic disk that's worth maybe a nickel, maybe a penny, and you add invisible software bits on it, and magically it's worth $400. But the other you know, difference is you don't have to call up the treasury and ask them how to use money. People more or less know how to use money almost from birth. But you do have to call up companies and ask them how to use their software. Now, here's the economics of mass production. When you have something that's mass produced, you can't possibly meet 100% of the needs of everybody. As a marketing company, you only figure that maybe you can meet 70 to 90% of the needs of 70 to 80% of the market. So do the math. You're actually meeting half, less than half of the needs of anybody on the average. That's a pretty poor record, actually. That's flunking in my school, 50%. That's flunking. You didn't pass, you got at least a 60. And the reason they do this is they say, software is a commodity. Oh yeah, office systems, that's a commodity. Operating systems, that's a commodity. Not when I was writing operating systems. I had customers out there with a stopwatch who would say, hey, you know, we're getting 12,000 TPCs from you and only 11,997 TCPs from you, so we're going to take you. Your system crashes once every three years and your system crashes once every two years, 364.5 days. We're going to take yours. You know what a commodity is? A commodity is a can of corn. You go into the food market and there's these cans of corn on the shelf. One of them's made from Green Giant, one of them's made from Del Monte, and one of them is this kind of a white label thing, you know, with, with a barcode on it or something. That's the cheapest one. Yet people will buy the other ones. Why? Because they're a brand. And somehow this can of corn is better than that can of corn. Well, you want to know a secret? They're all canned by the same company. Just different labels. But yet, if you stand there for any more than 10 minutes in front of that thing, trying to decide which can of corn to buy, the supermarket manager will come over and he'll say, what are you doing, sir? And he'll say, I'm trying to decide whether to buy this can of corn or that can of corn. And, and can I mix the two cans of corn together in my pot, or do I have to put them in separate pots? And how many people will that can of corn feed? And by the time you get the second question out, the store manager's going like this to bring over the security guard, because you are crazy, and he wants you out of the store. Now compare that to a car. Every car is a steering wheel, or a gas pedal, and a brake. Some have a stick shift, or some are automatic. But all of them give some form of transportation. But how many of you will take a suitcase full of money down to the car lot and say, here, take my suitcase of money. Just give me a car, any car, I don't care. You spend a lot of time looking at the car because you want to know that the car can carry your family, it's safe, gets good gas mileage, you know, long lasting stuff like that. So cars are not commodities and neither is software. 
And in the 42 years I've been in the business, I've never seen any two business problems that were the same. They're just as unidentical as snowflakes. They all look white, but when you really look at them, they're different. So, why is that a problem? Imagine that what these circles are business problems, and you have to find the software that's going to fix them. The only problem is the software only comes in squares. Can't change the size of the square, can't change the shape of the square. All you can do is buy the square. Notice it doesn't fill the whole problem. So what you do is you go out and buy another software package. Oh, look, there's still blue showing through. That means my problem isn't completely solved. Can't change the size, can't put them together because you can't change them. Oh, another package, another package. Surely one more will do it. Oh, sh look at that. I know what I do. I'll buy a big, big package like SAP or PeopleSoft or Oracle. There we go. No problem. But you know the real problem is it takes up too much resources. It's very complex for my people, my employees to use or my customers to use. What I wouldn't do to be able to just change that a little bit and make it fit my actual problem. But I can't because I don't have the source code. Another thing that a large company has been talking about recently is total cost of ownership. This company kept saying for a long time that open source code was more expensive in reality than their products. After a while, they actually got a company to do a research project and they changed it slightly. They said that their products were equally expensive or that open source was equally expensive as their products. And the way they rationalized it was this. Even though you had to pay for their products, where you didn't have to necessarily pay for open source, they said that the cost of the people who gave support to open source was higher. Because these people were rarer. They, were, they weren't as, as easy to find as closed source people. And I started sitting there scratching my head and said, let me get this straight. That support people that work with open source get paid more money than the people who work with closed source. That's what they were saying. Is that a problem? I don't think so. And, or the other thing they were saying is, university professors, if you're trying to help your students out, if you're trying to help them get a good job, here's a field they can go into because number one, there's a shortage of them, and number two, they get paid more money. Now, why would they get paid more money? It's because it isn't total cost of ownership you have to worry about. If you can't afford the solution in the first place, that's a problem. But after you get over total cost of ownership, you go on to the next thing, which is called return on investment. In other words, what's the value I get out of the solution as opposed to the money I put in? And if I am a business person, I'll have a certain amount of money. Let's say I have 1,000 euros. And if I could put my 1,000 euros over here and get a million euros, or put it over here and get 5 million euros, that's where I put it. Because my return on investment is higher. So a lot of people really don't want products. We talked about cars a little bit. I actually hate cars. I really do. And actually, if I lived in New York City, I would loathe cars. Why? Because in New York City, you can't find a place to park a car. You know, it's hard to find a gas station. Traffic is miserable. What I want is the service of transportation. I want to be able to come out of my apartment and have my limousine waiting for me. I get into the back of the limousine, I say, James, I'm going to the World Trade Center. I open up my notebook, I start working as James weaves his way through traffic. James leaves me off at the World Trade Center and I go inside to do business with Mr. Trump. 
When I come out, James is there again, picks me up, takes me home, and drops me off, and I don't have to worry about parking my car. Or food. A lot of people love cooking. I hate cooking. And I especially hate washing dishes. So I want the service of food. I go out to my favorite restaurant. There's the maitre d'. I say, hi, James, doing double duty. I didn't pay him enough as a chauffeur. Hi, James. He says, your favorite wine, sir? Yes, I have a favorite wine. And I have a wonderful meal, and I go away, and all I have to do is pay a little money for it. It's the service of food. And most people want the service of software. They actually hate software. In fact, most people actually hate computers. We're all strange. We are strange because we like computers. We like dickering with them. Most people hate it. So what they want is to be able, hmm, and what they want is a slide projector that goes forward. <laughs> Uh-oh. Oh, well. Oh, now I'm working with a, okay. So what they want is service. And people think of service like flipping hamburgers or sweeping the street. And certainly those are service jobs. But I think of service like a brain surgeon. A brain surgeon doesn't create a product. You don't end up with a second brain when they get finished. They repair the brain you've got. But they're a highly paid person. You don't look for a brain surgeon who advertises and says, I do brain surgery cheap. I use last year's x-ray machine. You know, I don't wash my hands in between brain surgeries. You don't look for that because your brain's important to you. Trust me, a business person, their business is more important than their brain. Ask any one of them, take my, take my brain, I don't care, but leave my business. Lawyers, God knows lawyers don't produce anything useful, but you pay them a lot of money because you value their expertise and they keep you out of trouble sometimes. So what I'm talking about a service is not just a packaged product installer. What I'm talking about with service is a person who can tune that system, change that software to meet the customer's needs. 80% of all the software written in the world today is not through packaged software. It's written by systems administrators, embedded systems people. It's written by people doing manufacturing software. It's written by people doing astronomy because you know, you can't go down off the shelf and find your black hole software. It just doesn't exist. You know, trying to find the, the, the quark or, you know, or, or all these, you just don't find that software any place. It's being written by people who need that software for other purposes. And if you're hiring one of those people, why not hire a free software person? Somebody who's used to leveraging the software that other people have written to help you solve your problems. And then why not make your solution open source? Do you have a direct competitor who's gonna take advantage of that? Or is this something that's outside of direct competition? Now in Rio de Janeiro, there was a small company who was investigating the rainforest for making farm, new pharmaceuticals and they needed some proprietary software from a company that made GIS software, geographical information software, you know, mapping and stuff like this. And this software, this company made software that was breathtakingly expensive. Now there's two types of proprietary software in the world. There's software that's just a little expensive, and then there's software like this that's breathtakingly expensive. It was $500,000 a copy, and the little company needed nine copies. $4.5 million. But the real problem was this company was in Brazil, and they only spoke Portuguese. Can you imagine somebody that can't speak English? That's ridiculous. You know, everybody should be able to speak English, right? But this company could only speak Portuguese. So they went to the, co the large company and they said, please, for $4.5 million, 
couldn't you make a copy of your software that prompted in Portuguese? And the big company said, no, it's not in our best business interest. Remember that phrase. It comes back every once in a while. So the little company went to an open source developer and said, we don't need all the functionality. We just need this little bit. Can you do this with free software? And the open source developer said, yes. I can use Postgres to store the data. I can use OpenGIS to do the mapping. I can use GNU plot to print out the maps. I can use Perl to bring it all together. And in three months, for a total cost of $380,000, they had exactly what they needed, and it prompted in Portuguese. So now I'm going to ask you a question. What was the value of this software? Some people might say the software was, the value of the software was $380,000 because that's what the programmer was paid. Other people might say the value of the software was $4.5 million because that's how much money the little company saved by not having to pay for the software that they couldn't use. But the real, the real answer is that this software was infinitely valuable because without it, the little company could not exist. And that is where you have to make the line of yourself as a programmer. Do you charge the $380,000, the 4.5, or the infinite? Well, the programmer made $380,000 for three months worth of work. How many of you have done that? Oh, good, good. Well, you know, but the rest of you, it'd be a good job, okay? So let's look at another example. St. Petersburg, Russia. This is a turbine test bed. It's used to test steam turbines for efficiency. The customers of the turbine test bed are engineers who are designing these turbines. These five turbine test beds Four of them use proprietary software that's very expensive, is only available in English, and is very inflexible. If you want to have a change made to it, it takes at least a month for the company to make the change, and they charge you a lot of money. The fifth turbine test bed in St. Petersburg uses free software to control its turbines. You might ask QL to store the data, GNU plot, to draw out the plots which are there. Um, Tickle TK to draw the place where the, where the sensors are put, and Python to tie it all together. Not only did he not have to pay for any of his software, but if his customers ask for a small change, he can typically do it overnight. So his engineering customers get much better service than the ones that are using proprietary software. It's not the cost, it's the value. Sao Paulo subway system was very dirty, but the person who ran it had no money for subway cleaners. He decided to use Open Office instead of Microsoft Office. And with the money he saved for not having to buy the licenses, he hired 35 subway cleaners. They started cleaning the subways and ridership went up because people said the subways are cleaner now. When he had ridership went up, he had more money for more subway cleaners. He said to me, Mad Dog, in the entire time I've been in this business, that a single person came up to me and said, Thank you for using Microsoft Office because your letters look so good. But many people had come up to him thanking him for clean subways. It's not the cost, it's where you divert the money. It's where you get the better bang for your buck. Caixa Economia Federal, State Bank of Brazil, runs the lottery system. They used to run it with proprietary software. It cost them one million reais, about half a million dollars a month maintenance. The real problem was it took 10 months to develop a new software game. 
They switched to free software, hired three FOSS programmers, and now they could produce a new game in three weeks. Brazil has 194 million people. Do you know how much money you generate when you have a new game nine months and one week early? You generate a lot of money. No, no. A lot of money. And they really didn't care that they also saved about one half million dollars a month. A value-added reseller buys computer components and puts them together into a package that is of more value to their customers. They create a solution for the customers. They're not being paid for the hours they work. They're being paid for the solution for their customer. You may be able to use the same solution for many customers or a solution that's slightly different for other customers. So you leverage the time you spent with that first customer. These are things you should be thinking about as you go into the business. There's a company close to me that used to have a huge proprietary product. Their engineers are spending all of their time porting it to different hardware platforms. They made most of the product a free and open source project and the community did the porting. They refocused their engineers on developing closed source proprietary modules that they sold to large companies. They lowered their cost of engineering, they lowered their cost of sales, they lowered their cost of support, and they had more functionality than ever, and they made more money than ever. Project.net is a project management system. It was purchased as a proprietary product by a friend of mine. They were charging $2,000 a copy for this system, and they would sell two copies every month. He noticed that 60% of the people who bought his product also bought a support package and training. So he said, what happens if I give it away? The answer is, 2,000 people a month pulled it down, and 60% of them bought a support contract, and he made more money than ever. A friend of mine is a systems administrator. He goes home at night, and while his significant other is watching TV, he's coding on his notebook. He submits his work upstream, and the next day he goes into work, he says, Bad Dog, I found out that 10,000 other people were doing the same thing last night. So the code that I wrote is like, is like whispering into the end of a trumpet and having a large noise and music come out the other side. These are the types of things you need to think about as an open source developer. Here's another thing you should not do. Do not price yourself too low. You are valuable people. You're valuable programmers. It's easier to price yourself high and give a good discount. Oh, you can't afford my prices? Well, it's Tuesday. You're in luck. Yo, here's it, here's it. But if you price too low, it's hard to raise them back up again. I have a friend of mine here in Germany. His name is Lucas. He's a security expert. And one day he came to me, he says, Mad Dog, I have this problem. I have so much work, I don't have enough time to do all the fun stuff I like to do. I says, how much do you charge? He says, $1,000 a day. He had three people working for him. I said, how much do you charge for them? $1,000 a day. I said, that's your problem. Why should your customers be coming to you to the people underneath of you when you're looked at as the expert. You should be charging $5,000 a day. He says, if I charge that much, I won't get as much business. I said, what do you care? You know, you only need, you can have half the business and still make more money. And besides the fact, the people underneath of you will now get more business because they're less, you can raise their price to $3,000 a day. So he took my advice. He came back a month later, he says, it didn't work. 
I said, why not? He says, I raised my price to $5,000, and people said, wow, he must be really good. He got more business than ever. If you're going into the support business, take my advice. Don't go in as a single person. Someday you want to be able to take vacation, and your customers are going to want to know who will help them when you're on vacation. It's better, I, I recommend to people that you form a cooperative and that you find other people that would also support, supply support. You can share resources like sales, legal, and admin. And you pull your work together and you pull your profits out. Companies like cooperatives better because they look like another business to them instead of a lone wolf support person. Here's something not to do with free software. I had a person come up to me, said, Mad Dog, I listened to you at a conference. I did everything you did. I lost all my money. I said, what'd you do? I had this great idea for a new product. I went out, borrowed a lot of money, hired a bunch of engineers, turned it out to a free software license, and people just took it, never paid me anything for it, and I lost all my money. I said, you didn't listen to me. I never told you to do that because the first thing I told you was come up with a good business plan. Know who your customers are, know how they're going to pay you, know what your value is, then implement your free software solution. Blender was one of those. We talked about this before. It started off as proprietary, be it was designed by the users, and the software was purchased and has continued to be worked on by the users. A lot of people start to use Blender and they say it's a really difficult interface to get started with. But once they get over that learning hump, they really like it because it was made to be used by professionals and to save time and energy. Publicly funded software is another thing that you could go in and make money from. Money that is funded by taxes, the software should be free after it is written. So from my viewpoint, free software should have an advantage in these areas because you can leverage more for the amount of money that you charge. Government software is the same thing. And government software should be long lasting. We no longer can run government without software. If all of a sudden software was to disappear, planes would fall from the sky and elevators would stop working. So you have to ask yourself, how long is this company producing proprietary software going to be in business? And people say to me, well, Mad Dog, that's why I buy my software from a large company like Oracle or Microsoft. I say, really? Have you ever heard of a company called Apollo or Wang or Digital Equipment Corporation or Compaq? Stop me when you've heard of these because at one time, every single one of them was the second largest company on the face of the earth. There's another company called Nortel, second largest telephone company in the world and in less than two years, they went bankrupt. Another company you may have heard of called RIM is in very dangerous thing right now. Nokia, very dangerous thing right now, okay? And you have to think about this when you're in government. Educators, free software teaches students twice. Not only how to use the software, but how the software works. You can't see the second one when you're using closed source proprietary software. If you want to, you could also teach your students how to change the software and so you can teach them collaboration. A lot of people say, I want to be able to get a university education. I believe that you can actually get a university education these days for free. All you need is access to the internet and a plan on how to do it. You can learn by following what the universities have in their 
syllabus and in their certification techniques. Once you learn the information, you can show people that you know what you know by joining into a project and creating a portfolio of code which you can show to a potential employer. One last comment on value. When Linux, when I first got involved with Linux, I had about 2,000 CDs made up of Red Hat version 5.2. It was the same distribution that we had for the alpha. And I was giving these out as I went around the world talking about free software. I got to the island of Fiji. At that point in time, Fiji was connected to the internet by one 1200 bit per second modem. I went to the university and said, here is a CD of Linux. And they were so excited because they had tried to download Linux over the internet, but they would get halfway through the kernel and there'd be a big storm in the South Pacific and the line would drop. They have to start over again. As I gave them that CD, I felt a little bit like this. Like God giving the knowledge of good and evil to Adam. Now with that, I'd like to just do a couple seconds about Project Kawa, a project I'm working on in Latin America. It's about creating three to four million new high-tech jobs inside of Latin America and potentially other places around the world. The way we're going to be doing this is to create millions of entrepreneurs, people who will be selling computing services to people who need them. We believe that by doing this, we'll be able to cut down on the amount of electrical, uh, electricity used by computing We'll be able to make computers easier to use for the end user. We'll be able to provide a gratis wireless internet bubble over large urban areas and be able to create a low-cost supercomputer grid and do this all without government funding. How are we going to do this? We're going to be using thin clients that use less than 10 watts of electricity to replace desktop computers. They'll be hardwired via Ethernet to a server system in the basement of buildings, and everything will, uh, the, the server systems will hold the data and the programs for the thin clients. The thin clients will be creating the wireless mesh mode node from themselves, but remember that each one of them is hardwired to the server in the basement, so it has a um, a cable that you can reply quality of service to, unlike a lot of other mesh networks. We are going to have a person who will own all of this equipment. They will be a systems administrator entrepreneur who will provide the services of computing as well as other services to the end users. We'll use private bank loans to finance all of this, and the bank loans will be paid back over time, and then the money recircled back for additional entrepreneurs to go into business. These entrepreneurs will be their own sales agents and their own supporting services. Now, if you take a look at this, build, at this group of buildings, this is Sao Paulo, Brazil. It's the second largest city on the, face, on the Western Hemisphere. It has 19 million people in it. 83% of the people in Latin America live in an urban environment. And so we believe that there's a lot of cities in Brazil and in the rest of Latin America, including Mexico, that could benefit from this type of a system. These people, these entrepreneurs, in effect, will be their own ISPs, and they will be providing systems like backup services, disk storage management, security, training and education for their customers, and creating specialized applications for both business and home. So in the summary of this talk, you have to study both the technology and business to become a good entrepreneur. You can learn from other free software projects, but you have to determine the business area that you wish to go in and not only develop the technology, but the business acumen. If you charge too little for your services, 
there may be a time where you don't get a job. And now you go scraping from place to place. But if you charge the right amount, if you charge for the benefit that you give to the customer, then if you get a little bit of extra money from that, you can use that to get over those hard humps of not having the money come in. And you could also use that money to fund development of projects that you want to do on your own or for fun. So thank you very much for your time. And if you have any questions, I'll try and answer them. Okay, there's a question there in the back, and I'm, okay. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to ask, um, with the move towards um, mobile computing, particularly, uh, you know, the new Windows being very mobile, um, and with all of those systems being very uh, closed uh, by, in comparison to kind of the general purpose computing that we're used to, what, how do you think that's going to play, play out for Linux uh, and for open source software? Do you think it's going to kind of get forced into a niche? Or do you think that there are um, advantages for, uh, for, the, for that ecosystem? Well, first of all, I'm glad you used the term Linux because if Richard Stallman was here, he'd say well, you have to differentiate between GNU Linux and Android Linux because Android is based on the Linux kernel. Right now, a lot of people look at Android and say it's fairly closed. But there are business reasons why somebody might want to have a more or less closed system while it's under development, then turn the source code over to people for distribution. And for the most part, that's a lot of what uh, Google has been doing with Android. There are people who create the, to take the Android distribution and recompile it, change it, and put it out so that people could put different versions of Android into their phones. Um, also, tablets. Now, I had a big discussion at lunch about this, and it's interesting when you take a look at history. Apple, with all of its really good engineering, quite frankly, and its control over both the hardware and the software, still only ended up with about 9% of the desktop market. So here comes iOS. They had it out there for about a year before Android went out. They built up a huge application base. And yet now, Android is out shipping Apple on phones. And the reason is exactly the same reason why Microsoft owned 90% of the desktop market versus Apple's 9%. It's because Microsoft allowed other people to make money with their software. And Google is allowing hardware people, different carriers, and different uh, handset makers to make money with Android. Apple is very careful to only allow certain applications onto iOS through their marketplace. Android says, hey, go ahead and ship it. And actually, if you can't get into our marketplace, here's a bunch of other marketplaces out there. So. You know, a lot of people say that it's technology which actually sells stuff. It's not. It's marketing. And it's allowing other people to make money off of what you do. It's volume. Volume is everything. Okay? When, when we used to put out operating systems at digital, and we would go to the vendors and we would say, would you please put your application on our new operating system? And they would say, how many copies do you have out there? Well, we don't have any. When we think next week, we'll probably have 20 or 30. And these companies would say, well, we can't put our application on there because you don't have the right compiler or you don't have the right debugger or something like that. But if we went out there and said, hi, we have 100,000 of them out there, and we're shipping them at the rate of 10,000 a week. 
Then the application vendor would say, we're just kidding. We really have the application working back in the lab already. You know, we can have it out there tomorrow night, you know, on the Lady Express. It's volume. That's all they're interested in. And so Android right now is shipping in greater volume, much greater volume than iOS. Now there's this other mobile operating system. It rhymes with Bindos. And right now they're about 2% of the smartphone market. Maybe they'll leverage it. I don't know. But we'll have to see. I think that open source on applications and on, on the telephones, I think it will loosen up after a while. There's also an, another operating system that's kind of interesting. It's one being done by Netscape. That in reality is just the browser on the phone and the applications will be written in HTML5. And Netscape, which seems to know a little bit about browsers, thinks that this will be something that will be attractive for the very low price, low cost market. Next question. Yes, sir. Um, well, thank you first. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I wanted to ask, because a lot of uh, games and entertainment in that regard are uh, very DRM focused and most of them ship on Windows and a lot of people choose Windows over Linux because of games. Uh, what kind of um, business opportunities can you see in open source for like games and that kind of stuff? Well, first of all, I started off by saying that volume is everything. So while, my, while, while Apple owns about, actually they own about 7% of the desktop market, Microsoft owns about 90%, uh, Linux owns about 2 to 3% of the market. The good news is that Linux, is, as, a, as a not desktop operating system, is actually outselling Apple on the desktop now. So we're taking away uh, market share from both Apple and this other company. So that's the good news. Um, the bad news is it's still a while probably before we get uh, games that would be written natively to the Linux uh, desktop. But it's interesting with virtual machines because you could actually run Android on top of your Linux system and have games that are written for Android. And that might be a way that we would get a lot more games in. Another thing that's happening is a lot of game manufacturers are not so much concerned about the client and the game. It's more about the data of the game, which is being served up from a server. And so they would be willing to give away the client side part of the game as long as people would go to their server, log in, and pay money to do that. Or they're selling lots of things which have nothing to do with the game, with the game code itself. You know, fuzzy little birds, little pigs, stuff like that, where they make a lot of money on that. And therefore, they'd be just as happy to have an application to run across all three operating systems. So these are all ways that the game situation might be changing. And I think that it is changing in the market. There have been several announcements recently of more companies being willing to contribute a game. Now the problem, that it's more than just volume, because I hate to mention this, but piracy hurts games, okay? Gamers seem to be those people who don't want to part with their money the most when it comes to pirating software. Now, the United States pirates about 34% of its desktop PC software. Richest country in the face of the earth, we still steal 34% of it. Um, Brazil, my Brazilian friends over there, they pirate 84% of their desktop PC software. Vietnam pirates 96% of 
of its desktop PC software. The average Vietnamese person makes about four US dollars a day. They can get a cast off PC out of the trash can, but when they go to buy software for it, they have to pay $400 for this shiny plastic disc. And they know that that shiny plastic disc didn't cost $400 because they can go down the street to their local software piracy dealer and get it for like a dollar. So, you know, when your when you're GDP is very, very low, you tend to be more of a software pirate than not. But the problem with pirated software is that you can't call up Mr. Bill and say, hey, Bill, I need a fix, you know, and I'll, and I'll pay you for it. Because the first thing he says is, well, where'd you get the software? You can't ask for training. You can't ask for support. And even if you could, you're paying somebody to fix it at US programmers' salaries. With free software, you can pull it down, and if you need a change, you can go to your local university student, give them a couple six packs of beer, and they'll make it for you. And so you get, to, you get to hire a programmer on your programming salary level, which you might be able to afford. So these are some of the things that are beginning to change this. And today, there's about 1.5 billion desktop computers. But there's 6.3 billion people on the face of the planet. And that means that there's 5.8 billion people who haven't selected their desktop yet. And these people don't speak a major Western language. And they don't do business the way a major Western company would. So they tend to use free software. Next question. Way in the back. Hi there. Um, there's a shift towards mobile devices and embedded devices. Uh, so I think that the uh, the way that Microsoft uh, imposes the market and uh, Linux has only a small part of the market. Uh, is, there, is there a possibility that, that Linux will shift over, uh, over Microsoft? Because uh, embedded devices, uh, the TV was, uh, um, with, with, with the software to, to go into the internet, uh, the, the, the portable handy, the smartphone, uh, so the, the people don't want to have a desktop computer anymore, and this will bring the shift uh, which Linux uh, couldn't uh, uh, get over the, the last 30 years. Open soft. There's a couple of things which are happening here. When Linux first started off, the dominant interface was Windows. Okay, that's what everybody accessed their computer system through was Windows and that graphical interface. But today, we don't have that. Today, people access their computer systems through so many different interfaces. iOS, Android, browsers. The people that used to say, I'm only doing it through this interface, are now bombarded by different interfaces. So there is no common interface anymore. People are getting used to having a different interface, doing something different to get at their software. Particularly young people growing up, they're fearless. Give them a new interface and boom, they'll learn it in 20, 22 seconds, right? And then say, oh, mom and dad, you're all foggy. So that's a big thing. The second thing is that in reality, the desktop is the only place that Linux is still trying to catch up. The top 500 supercomputers in the world, 98% of them use Linux. Some use BSD, and one uses a Microsoft product because they're paid to. <laughs> Linux is the most used operating system in embedded system starts, embedded system designs. It used to be other operating systems, but it's very expensive to do that. 
And Linux is used on half of all the server systems in the world. And some are proprietary systems, and some are Microsoft, and some are, a few are Apple. Apple isn't known for their server systems. So Linux is one of the most dominant operating systems. And the only place that we're really missing is the desktop. So I think that there's going to be a, a big change in the near future. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for coming. Have a great campus party.